Hello, hello, hello. What's up, everybody? How's my audio? How's my video? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Joseph Gasson says, I will not read your comments, sir. <laughs> Play nice today, everybody. All right, so I'm a little bit late. We were having some, tef some technical difficulties. My guest is having some issues with his internet connection. He's in New Zealand. Um, so... He's in New Zealand. His internet connection is not very solid right now, and we're trying to get him on. So he's probably going to join us. Josh Lamaro is going to be on soon, or I'll just do a hangout, answer a few questions. We'll call it a day, and Josh and I will do this again another time. So the intention today was to talk about fascia, 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 whichever syllable you put in fossis on. It is the collagen network of the body. Some people talk about the collagen um, in the body, but fascia is actually made up of more than just collagen, and it is something that's ubiquitous throughout the entire body. It's something that it's almost it's kind of omnipresent in human. Now, the fascia is a fascinating topic to me. This is something that not many people focus on, something that not many people talk about, and if, just to interrupt myself, if anybody can confirm that you can hear me, that you can clearly hear me, and that my video is good, please let me know. Please confirm. We got more people jumping in by the moment. Again, sorry for the delay, guys, and sorry for the switch, the change in schedule. Um, I've been enjoying lately doing these live broadcasts, and it's interesting doing live interview broadcasts. Um, so it's something I've been testing out. Yesterday I did an interview with Naudi Aguilar. Um, he was taking it all over the place, man. Naudi was talking about, I had to try to keep him on subject. He was jumping all over the place talking about uh, robots and microchips. And um, But we had an actually very fascinating discussion about movement, about the human body, about the validity of certain types of training, Um as far as health and longevity and the maximization and optimization of your vitality and your well-being goes. So um, if anybody wants to get a little bit of an introduction to why fascia is so interesting, if you listen to that interview and you realize that no muscle is actually moving, the muscle is not what's actually moving. It's the fascia network, these bands of collagen and other material, these bands of what's called fascia um, that go throughout the entire body. Um, if you guys look into Thomas Myers, he's got a book called Anatomy Trains, which is pretty interesting. Um, let's see here. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah, I'm not sure if Josh is going to make it. His internet is still slow. We'll see if he jumps in. If he jumps in, he jumps in. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Fascia Network, what I find interesting about it, um, why it's something that I'm definitely going to try to expand upon and put out some more interesting content concerning because it's something that's very overlooked. It's ubiquitous throughout the human body. It is omnipresent throughout your body, wrapping every single muscle, permeating all the way out through your epidermis through your skin. It's part of the collagen network. So imagine this network that's going throughout your body that's as sensitive as the skin, that's transporting water and energy, electromagnetic, electromagnetic energy and light and communicating with your central nervous system, with your circulatory system, with every single one of your organs, holding your organs in place, holding the muscles and moving, extending, tensing and releasing the muscles in your body. This fascia network is something that nobody really thinks about. When we're, most people who get into uh, to fitness, they start looking at they start looking at isolation exercises. Everybody's doing the bench press, activate the chest, work the triceps. You work the shoulders. You work the delts. Hit the rear delts. Hit the front delts. We aren't as a being, as a body. We aren't a series of connected muscles. You aren't an, a system of isolated muscles um, working in a mechanical fashion. You're a highly complex and amazing and miraculous system full of so much 
that we don't understand. And the fascia network is kind of one of these things that's just underappreciated, under-researched, and hasn't really been explored as thoroughly as it should have been. And there's many reasons for this. Some of the reasons are when people started doing dissections, they were working on cadavers that were pretty old. Now, when a body is dead, when a body is all dried up, what happens to it? I'm well, not dried up. I just gave away the answer, folks. When you die, you get rigor mortis. The body gets rigid, it's stiff. When you're alive, it's fluid. It's moving. It's active. It's dynamic. It's full of living water, structured water. If you guys check out Dr. Uh, – actually, I'm sorry, uh, Professor – He's got a PhD, but Gerald Pollock's book, The Fourth Phase of Water. This is completely changing the way we look at biology, the way we look at the human physiology, the way we look at health, and the way we look at water, the most miraculous substance on this planet. <laughs> the most miraculous substance. Okay, that's not true. There's plenty of miraculous things. Gold is pretty amazing too. Um, I don't know. Everything's pretty amazing when you really look at it. I forget who it was. There's this quote. I forget who said it. Someone who was wicked smart said it. But essentially, if you look deeply enough into anything, anything is fascinating. But you don't even have to look that deep into fascia to find it freaking fascinating. But when they first started dissecting cadavers, they're dissecting cadavers that have got rigor mortis. The fascia is dead. It's rigid. When you're alive, your fascia is pumping water, fluid, light through it all the time. Electrical energy, electromagnetic energy. It's activated piezoelectrically. So when you step your foot on the ground, when you first put your toes down, or when you put your heel down, that piezoelectric force is going through this collagen network. That is in your skin, through your body, permeating through your muscle tissue, all the way into your bone, wrapping around that bone, which is also a piezoelectric crystal with a microcrystal in structure made up of apatite crystals, A-P-A-T-I-T-E, that are piezoelectric, meaning under pressure, it creates an electrical current. Every electrical current also has a magnetic field occurring with it. So this fascia network is essentially, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. This fascia network is essentially, and I could be completely wrong here. I'm just I'm blabbering about the research I've done, about the geeking out I've done about fascia over the last few weeks. Um, but it seems like it's almost it's, it's, a, it's amazing. <laughs> and it's perhaps creating Small magnetic fields, it is. It seems like it is creating these small magnetic fields in your body, which will communicate to other parts of your body. These fluctuations in magnetic field are what trigger the body to create certain hormones, to create muscle contractions, or whatever it is. But anyways, I was talking about when you step on the ground, the piezoelectric force, when you get that pressure, like if you take a quartz crystal, crystal and you put it under mechanical pressure, even if you just put it in water, that's mechanical pressure. It's a slight bit of, of pressure around it. All right. Sorry, guys. Josh Lamaro, the guy who's going to join me, is uh, <laughs> is asking for the link again. He's going to try to jump in here, and we'll see if it works. Anyways, so you step on the ground. Your foot goes down, or even me pushing my hands together. It creates that piezoelectric current, creates that magnetic field, and it turns on and it activates these muscles to actually catch it. I mean, when you're actually when you're putting that pressure on the collagen, it's creating an electrical current and magnetic field. To me, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, the body electric. If anybody doesn't understand why it's so fascinating to me that we're creating these magnetic fields and electrical currents through the body, read the body electric by Dr. Robert O. Becker. It's an amazing book. Incredible. Will open your eyes to a whole different way of looking at the human organism and looking. And how we really function. But anyways, there's so many cool things about the collagen network. So the collagen network is actually what hold the muscle and create the form of your body. If you were to pull out, if you're going to grab the collagen network from the top of my head and pull it out of my head, 
You know what happened? My body would just turn to like goo. My bones, of course, are dense. But you got nothing. That collagen network is what holds it together. So we start. We focus a lot on muscle, right? Because when they first started doing the uh, these these dissections back in the day of hue of cadavers, it was highly controversial. And they didn't have access to that many cadavers. They didn't have access to a lot of technology, so it could be hard to properly preserve them. So when you start cutting open a dead body that's got rigor mortis, this collagen stuff, it just kind of seemed like packing material. So that's like what they treated it as. Like it wasn't such a big deal. But a lot of these physicians, scientists, and even Hippocrates understood the vital importance of the fascia network and understood that it was something highly important in the living being. It's very, very hard. See, this whole anatomy thing, what's so crazy about anatomy, we're, we're dissecting dead bodies. You're not looking at a live body. You can't look at the living collagen network in your body. But I wish I could pull the video up, but I'd probably get hit for copyright infringement. Um, I forget what this video was called. Oh, man. Let me, let me try to find this name of this video so you guys can... All right, I don't know. I forget the name of the video. Maybe I'll remember it later on. But in this in this video, they put a camera underneath the skin and filmed the collagen network and looked at how it moves and how it communicates. And it behaves in this incredible nonlinear way, much like water. The collagen network behaves in this amazing way. You can actually see these droplets of water being dragged along it. You know when you see, when you look at like an, uh, an electrical current going through a wire or something, like bzz, bzz, bzz. you can see these like droplets of water moving along this collagen network of these little tiny fibers that are all interconnected. And they're forming these geometric patterns, but the fibers will slide across each other. And these aren't like individual fibers. It's kind of like water. Or if you look at it, it's one continuous fiber. But the way that it's forming and flowing and moving, it's just amazing. And they actually can deta detach. Let's see. Hippocrates and Galen directed live prisoners. I wonder if those are ancient notes available. They're ancient. Oh, wow. Hippocrates dissected live prisoners. I got to look into that. That's amazing. Um, shout out to Hippocrates. Breaking through barriers, dissecting live humans. Wow, that's freaking horrible. <laughs> Thanks for the comment, Jotho. Oh, what's up, Josh? You're on. Hey, man. I made it. <laughs> I was just telling everybody how like how terrible you were for not showing up and how I was wow. on time. And <laughs> <laughs> Here I am now. Fuck you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what's up, Josh? I just uh, was blabbering about my – just through kind of my minimal – knowledge about the fascia networks and kind of geeking out on all this stuff um, because I didn't even know if you're going to come or not. So I just started blabbering about some of the notes that I've been taking today about yeah. fascia. And somebody just gave put a comment. I was talking about how what's interesting to me is all these anatomy books, um, pretty much the entire way that we look at anatomy right now is through studying dead cadavers, is through studying people that got rigor mortis. So there's this yeah. hyper focus on like muscle tissue, but really not much of an awareness on the function of the fascia network, which is like mm. ubiquitous throughout the human body. And mm. this guy jumps in and comments. He goes, he goes, hypocrisy, Hippocrates and Galen dissected live prisoners. No, oh, okay. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. How interesting is that? They weren't so much <laughs> live after the dissection, I guess. <laughs> well, no, but, but when it started, that must have been quite the show, right? I, I see like Hillary Clinton and George Bush just sitting up there in the front row, just like, mm. <laughs> uh oh, I don't know if Josh is cutting out. Josh might have a an internet connection problem. Let's see if he comes back. Come back, Josh. Come back. I'm the only bald guy on camera now. Come on. All right, everybody. So anyways, that fascia network, in the video that I was talking about, 
the Fajo is behaving in like a non-linear fashion, and I just think that's absolutely fascinating, especially when you look at the intimate connection between water and the fascia and light, the traveling of light and the fascia. It is uh, – It's very interesting because these are substances that are also ubiquitous ubiquitous in life. You know, every single being alive needs water and needs light, needs sunlight or infrared heat. So I think it's – hey, there's Josh. You're on mute, dude. Why are you muted? Uh, I don't know. Here we go. Right. There you go. Unmuzzle yourself. Let's go. <laughs> So, yeah, I, mean, I was just, uh, I don't know. Now you're here to fact check me. I feel like, right. you know, like, uh, you know, when you're in like fourth grade or something and your teacher's late for class and there's like someone who like jump up in front of the class and kind of just entertain people for a while. That's kind of what I was doing. So what's up, man? Can you guys Josh is me? Up. I can hear you. Okay, that's cool. Good. You might not be able to see me or something. I'm getting an error at this end. Whatever. Let's just get on with it if you can hear me. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> see what we can do, man. I was just talking about Faja. Um, kind of just throwing out some uh, some things that confound and amaze me about it. And mm. I was talking about this video. And you probably know the video that I'm talking about um, where they put a camera underneath the skin to show. Yeah, yeah. With, okay. Do you know what that video was called? It's called uh, Strolling Under the Skin. It's by some French osteopaths. And you're an osteopath. I am. All right. So uh, I don't even want to ask you. I don't even want to ask you what that means because I know that it's it's a field that is so comprehensive. And from doing just a little bit of research in the osteopathy, like there's an amazing history there, and it seems like something that's, um, you know, that really could be highly beneficial and was once used in hospitals all throughout England, right? Yeah, and the US actually. So um, the modality of, of, well, the means of looking, I suppose, in terms of medicine was actually coined in, um, in Kirksville in the USA. And the early hospitals were actually uh, primarily in the States. But one of my colleagues <clears throat> um, frequently says the problem with osteopathy in terms of um, getting the word out about the, the means of looking is actually that they were too good. So everyone in the hospitals actually got better and there was no need to keep them on. So the hospital shut down because there were no more patients. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you gotta, the yeah, profits, kind of, uh, profit is king. Well, exactly. Wow. Yeah. So, um, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and the early osteopaths, of course, um, the primary sort of, um, modality through which they were treating was trying to potentiate, um, energy and fluid dynamics in the body, which of course um, relies heavily on the fascial network because it creates the channels through which all the vessels um, push themselves through during development. So um, essentially you've got all these uh, potential spaces between the fascial compartments, which is where all the vessels flow. So when the fascial network is um, potentiated in its function or, you know, is mobile, um, we have better fluid dynamics, better drainage of waste product, better delivery of nutrients, etc. Wow. Wow. So, all right. So what, what is the relationship between like water flow and fascia? Because if just going back to this video, one of the more amazing tidbits about um, the, uh, I, I, what was the video called again? I forgot already. Peeking uh, under the scroll, skin. Strolling under the skin. Strolling under this, the skin. So in this video, you can see those little water droplets. So what was going on? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, water essentially binds to collagen and hydrates it. So the level of hydration is directly proportional to how much energy can it can transfer. So I know that previously you've um, interviewed Ruben Salinas and Jack Cruz, and I don't know if the listeners who are listening now caught caught those interviews as well. But there's a lot of talk about this, uh, you know, easy water. Um, which is the water connected to a hydrophilic substance in the body. And in us, that hydrophilic substance is the collagen network. So it's, um, it's a uh, collagen proteins. Um, so, which we, so the water we, and the energy is like, everybody's looking at muscles. They're doing these dissections. They're looking at, okay, so there's the, there's this muscle, <laughs> there's this bone, but we're like, 
I mean, what, it seems like we're missing a big part of the picture. If this is the tr where water travels and where energy flow travels, why aren't we seeing more research in this? And are we just, is there research that we're just maybe missing out on? It's flying well, on the radar? I think, I think what happens is early on, I guess, if you, if you look some 500, 600 years ago, um, I guess in looking at our human body without the knowledge that we have today, you'd think, well, the best, the best way I can gain any knowledge about this body is to, to chop it open and see if I can see what parts are inside and how this thing ticks. But, you know, it, it's a daunting task to take apart something that exists with extreme complexity um, and internal coherence. And the minute you start breaking it down into its constituent parts, you've actually destroyed the coherence. So you might know a lot about the mechanical features of the body, but you know nothing about the way it works as a whole. Um, now that video that you're referring to is, is quite nice in that it opens a window into what the fascia looks like in the living state, which of course has some amazing properties. And uh, I'll just actually lead you to another video which takes some um, footage from that French uh, osteopathic video and is annotated by an American guy. And he has some computer generated imagery to um, model what's actually happening in the collagen network when he's looking at it. And there are parts of the, the collagen fibrils that can actually slide along one another. So, and they can split off from one uh, tendril of co but, uh, collagen. But they're not even sliding because the weird thing is there would be, there would, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, see, I've seen this video and it's like, okay, so there's two things is forming like a triangle. And then there's yep. one band that's yep. moving in between them, but it's not shortening, it's not lengthening. So it's, no. <laughs> it's behaving almost like water when you look at it, right? I mean, it's not, it's not changing exactly. form the way that you would expect something like a pen, like, oh, this <laughs> is going to slide along. It's not like that. It's like a water, watery. Yeah. It's really trippy looking. It's very incredible. And I don't know if you saw the other part where, let's say you've got the, you have a thick band like this, and then the thick band actually splits into two as the other one slides, and then it will, it will yeah. rejoin another thick band and, and just, it just joins somewhere else. Like it's a gel essentially. Yeah. So, um, it's completely fluid and it's like, and it's completely, it's very, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Now what confuses me is like, how come my, my, uh, scar tissue in my hips and my lower back <laughs> didn't behave like that. You know, it's like, what yeah. happens to make a collagen network? So, so dense. Like if somebody has got a lot of like an injury or something like that, what's really going on there with that, that density of matter that happens. Well, the way I see that kind of thing, and it, it, you can read a little bit of this in Robert Becker's book, The Body Electric, where he's saying that you get what's called an injury potential. So wherever the collagen network is split or torn apart, essentially you have, um, when you think of a, an electrical wire, for instance, where the current's running from one end to the other. So you split the wire in half and you have this um, accumulation of current, really, but it's got nowhere to flow. But that negative injury potential is actually what stimulates new tissue growth. Now, um, without the adequate uh, energy pushing through to sort of almost drag proteins and new um, structures to where they need to be laid down, you get a clumping effect. And so when the tissues clump together, they're not clumping along um, the same sort of line of energy transfer as they once were. So you sort of have a disorganized collagen network. And the interesting thing when a baby is in utero, if, the, if you could cause an injury to a baby in utero through, say, a scratch or a cut, it will actually heal without scarring. So it will join back together exactly how it should have because the energy flow through that being is actually um, so powerful and so coherent still. So it's getting constantly fed from the mother, I suppose, and all the nutrients required for tissue regrowth are there in abundant supply. Yeah. So it, it appears to be a, a bit of a, um, uh, a factor age, nutrition, um, hydration state, et cetera, are all coming into play with he how much you'll scar. For instance, an old person scars much, much uh, more heavily than a young person. So, um, well, what's, what's also interesting about, I mean, just kind of going about injuries and the collagen network and scars is, um, I mean, something that a lot of people experience anecdotally, I don't even know how much research there is about this, and it's probably something you've experienced quite a bit. But me, for instance, simply changing my posture and trying to figure out my posture and fix my movement patterns. Um, you know, it's like not just posture. It doesn't matter if you can stand up and have great posture. If, if as soon as you start walking, it goes out, then, then what's the point, right? So mm. just through trying to correct some imbalances in my body and just doing this obsessively for years, 
out of necessity because of you know scoliosis, a scoliosis, a little bit of a hyperlordosis, and kyphosis. I mean, the kyphosis and hyperlordosis when your butt sticks out and when mm-hmm. your shoulders are slumped, that's normal, like among most of the population now. And uh, I don't know about the scoliosis, but anyways, just through changing this, there seems to be a major like detoxification aspect to the collagen network and to these old holding patterns that the collagen network can have because as I was talking about earlier before you jumped on, um, the collagen is kind of like what gives us our form, right? Like we, if you just pulled oh. all the collagen out, you would kind of drop like a bag of goo or like Slimer or something. Um, yeah. So Yeah, well, no, yeah, no what, joint surface the, is actually uh, touched. So if, if the joint surface is not touching, something else is holding them um, apart and it's almost like a, a packing tape effect. Um, so yeah, it, it's been said that if you could dissolve muscle bone you know, arterial tissue, et cetera, and only leave the collagen, you'd still have a ghostly figure of a person standing there. Um, so it, it really is ubiquitous and it's everywhere. And I mean, even bone um, is just essentially um, ossified and mineralized collagen. So <laughs> it begins as collagen and it turns into bone um, governed by force. So, so when a baby, you're talking about a baby earlier, and a baby is mostly collagen, right? Yeah, cartilage and collagen essentially. And so, um, if you were to say uh, Google an image of a baby skull, you'd see that none of the there's huge gaps between all the joints. And you know, with your own baby, if you touch on the forehead here, you can feel the fontanelle, which is the, the gap where you can basically feel the the brain underneath. So you're feeling the gap between these um, cartilaginous and collagen um, pre-bone structures that are yet to harden. Um, and even when they do harden, they're sort of uh, they the Sutures in the, in the skull are actually more like tectonic plates, so they, they sit with like a, a comb-like um, structure like this, and they're still able to move. So um, those joints can move you know, quite a bit, really. I mean, it, it's impalpable to most people who say that it's rigid and fixed, but there are slight movements of the skull that are occurring all the time. And let's face it, they'd have to be. I mean, you can't, you'd wear things out so quickly, like the, the jaw, the TMJ here would wear out so quickly if we didn't have subtle movement of the rest of the bones. Um, What's well, amazing. So it's funny that just something that comes to mind, and this is just a comment. Um, you, you, we were talking about like magnetism before, and how the collagen network kind of you know it's where light travels, it's where water travels, and energy travels. And with the electrical current that travels through the collagen, you have a magnetic field. And mm-hmm. a baby that's mostly collagen. Anybody who's ever held a newborn baby, it's 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 so full of energy. It's something that's almost impalpable, but it is so tangible. It's so absolutely there and it's so real um you know my son was born six weeks ago yeah and you feel it and if you feel it in your heart you feel it in your heart and it's just it completely changes your consciousness and everybody around it's just you know it's it's like you're holding the ark of the covenant or something this thing is just so full of life and um yeah that's just an interesting comment about what you're talking about the magnetism and uh Yeah, it's quite therapeutic holding a newborn. I mean, uh, I have friends who, when they had their firstborn, I think we went somewhere to a party and and the day after we were all hung over, you know, and Katie brought the baby around and said, "Um, here, hold him. It's really therapeutic. (laughs) It was basically, you know, moving people's hangovers. (laughs) So So it's so amazing, man. And especially when you have your own, like, if, if you ever take the plunge, which I highly recommend, it's freaking awesome. Um, it's just the first like six weeks are just so amazing, just pure potential and, and they're so yeah. fragile, but at the same time, just so energy dense. But they're yeah, so um, do you, do you notice? what's that? They're so resilient at the same time. I mean, you say they're fragile, but essentially it's, it's the most resilient you'll ever be at that age. It, it's incredible. They're fragile. They're resilient. They're fluid. They're not, they're not stiff, you know, they're just, but at the same time, like when they lay down and stuff, they can, they become, they form to whatever, um, whatever space that they're in and their movement, it's, you know, they're, they're very good at like just being able to lay down anywhere, um, mm. which I guess as we grow up, we get more rigid, right? Well, indeed. And, um, and as I was just going to say, they form to their environment, right? So the, the more, um, enriching that environment is during the developmental years and the better the structural integrity of that child will become because the ossification and the hardening of the collagen network was so pure as a baby uh, is totally dependent on the forces acting upon that body so um, yeah, yeah the, the more enriched the environment is the more um, 
the more open and varied, uh, then the better the development of the child. And we were just, my wife and I were just discussing last night, the, um, there's a the show on television that had all these Japanese people uh, walking down the street and so many of them have like a bow legged appearance. And we were just sort of mm. speculating on why that might be so um, prevalent in these high density Asian countries. And I figure it, it might actually be a, a question of space, how much space they have to actually um, develop and crawl around on the floor and things like this might actually hinder the, the development of the tibia and things like that. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it was an interesting sort of a discussion around yeah. you know, what actually yeah. forms our structure as an adult. So. There's yeah, though it's 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 all so freaking interesting. Now I I kind of before I took us on this tangent, I was asking a question about like a kind of a detoxification that I noticed myself going through, and I don't know, maybe it's just how I react to it, and I know we all got different reactions, but this seems like there's just this major component when you change your posture, when you're getting rid of these rigid holding patterns, which are also associated with you know, I mean they're caused by emotional, psychological things and that could be traumatic or that could just be you training it and moving it in a certain way for a long time or living in a certain environment um i noticed that there's like a huge detoxification component um i mean does does the fascia hold on to toxins or or what do you think what do you think is actually going on there when people are breaking apart scar tissue from an injury and they're just like they you know they, they get those those detoxification type symptoms well you know, the founder of osteopathy, Andrew Taylor Still, one of his core tenets um, in, in the creation of the osteopathic model was that whenever there is stasis, there's going to be disease. So just like we were saying before, a scar is more rigid than the living, <clears throat> the living um, pure collagen matrix. You've got a stasis of water, you have a stasis of lymph, uh, you have a stasis of movement in general around that area. It's less mobile and it's more um, fibrous, for example. So... Um, remembering that the body is built for movement, that's why we're filled with so many joints, you know. Uh, it, it's why that collagen looks the way it does when you watch that French video. We're built for movement and movement is what helps uh, potentiate the fluid dynamics in the body. Without it, we'll have a pooling, we'll have a stasis. It's just like a, like a swamp, for example. A, a swamp tends to have kind of stinky water, right, compared to, say, the ocean. <laughs> so you're, you're looking at stagnant, stagnant, old, dead, dense crap in there. Everything like that, yeah. So the detoxification reaction, I mean, it's not uncommon after a, an osteopathic treatment for somebody to jump up and need to go to the toilet and, and have sometimes yeah. diarrhea. <laughs> so, um, Well, I've, had, I've yeah. had periods where I went through major changes in posture. It's like, you know, because when you got like a scoliosis and then on top of that, because I had, I had diagnosed a scoliosis when I was like 13 and it wasn't major. You know, I was very surprised. I was like, no way when they did the, the seventh grade scoliosis testing but anyways i had a major injury after that so and that and it hit me in the left leg which was the longer the elongated leg um yep. the one that was probably off balance at creating that pelvic tilt which gave me the scoliosis i got hit on that leg and that really calcified in there in the hip and man when i when i started finally being able to do certain movements and connect my heel to my glute through to the head i had like I've had several instances where it was just like two or three days after like some intense like breathing and really getting into that fascia and doing some specific movement type stuff. Just weird looking exercises that nobody would want to uh, would probably want to replicate. Um, but yeah, I had like three or four days held up, just you know, poor digestion, just feeling lethargic and it was mm. huge. But then after that, I felt much better and could stand up straighter, and my core was more you know core is a weird word but my uh my midsection was straighter and my hips felt more connected yeah yeah and, and again like i was saying before the collagen network and the potential channels um are, are really what give rise to the lymphatic vessels so the more you can move this sort of stuff the more it's got to get out somewhere so it's it's either going to come out through the skin as like a detoxification reaction or a rash or acne or you're going to breathe it out, in which case the breathing will change. It might become more deep. Um, or it's going to come out through the, the urine and the uh, stool. So, um, again, though, because the fascia has no start point and end point, it's like a continuous, almost like a modus loop. There's no beginning and no end. It's an endless web. Then any time you affect uh, its motility, you're going to affect every organ in the body. And that's why I love practicing osteopathy because you can be working on someone's head and neck and you're hearing the gut go wild. It's starting to create some um, 
uh, some motility there and you can hear that you're affecting every organ of the system it's it's quite amazing and, and fun you know so it's absolutely incredible I think when people really when they when they get an understanding of what water is or you know what we don't know about water I guess but what we think water is now the new understandings of what water does um, and the function of uh, if, if they read like Dr. Robert O. Becker's book the body electric and then they start to look at some of these images of what the collagen network does when it's moving and looking at some of this research or even getting into like um, I don't know, Thomas Myers thing seems pretty interesting um, yeah I, I just ordered his book anatomy trains um, and I'd maybe like to get him on and talk about some of this stuff too but it seems like once people really get into that it's like almost any other it it, tr it kind of overlaps and envelops your former understanding of how the body works and what you're saying about movement completely connects with me because I know in my own life like if I'm stressed out if I'm screwed up or whatever like in the past when I was a kid I know I got into really bad habits of stress and securities and stuff like that which would lock me up which would you know lock my heart up and and it wouldn't be flowing like I just didn't have energy flow through and um it's, it's incredible when you start to just look at the effects of like movement and hydration, which it seems like they're intimately connected. Um, oh, indeed. Just, um, just on the Thomas Myers, I went and I did Thomas Myers course some seven or so years ago. And um, prior to that, I've had some contact with who, a guy who's now a good friend, Philip Beach, who's an osteopath in New Zealand. Now, look his book up it's called muscles and meridians and it's largely about the uh the way the collagen network forms through um through development in utero and, and so uh, all the way from the point of conception all the way through the embryological field and how these things actually get pushed and dragged and become the structures that they become and he's coined a model that he calls the contractile fields <clears throat> and um he basically posits that even the acupuncture meridians are emergent lines of shape control. And he has a number of cool diagrams in the book um, in which he's got a person standing underwater and a swordfish, <laughs> this is just his analogy, it could be a knitting needle, it could be a pin, but in the picture he's got a swordfish, he's poking the person right in the umbilicus. And it's eliciting a, a flexion movement where the, the organism who's getting poked <clears throat> actually coils around the stimulus. So you've got the, the pin sort of sticking him in the tummy like this, and that's the reaction to, to kind of get away and coil around to soften that structure. And so then he's got the next picture, which is where the pin actually hits the person in the pubic bone. And instead of flexing around the... Uh, All right, Josh. Josh will be back, guys. A little bit of technical difficulties. All right. So that was pretty amazing. He's <laughs> his Skype is still working, so I'll get some uh, getting some expletives through Skype from Josh. He'll be back, guys. Here he is. I'm here. Is that him? He's here. Oh, I'm man. here. Everybody was just. Calling Everybody, <laughs> all right. So you um, cut off right when you were talking about the second image. The second image. Okay, yeah. So, um, the, and the, <clears throat> so the first image, is, what he's trying to show is that um, there's different points of the body um, that will elicit different responses as a reflex um, uh, to noxious stimuli. So the first one, the, the guy's getting poked in the umbilicus and he flexes around. So if I stand up, if he's poked here, he flexes like this to, to get away from the stimuli. As you would see, like a slug when you poke it, it sort of coils around the, the stimuli and gets away from it. But then when the next one hits him in how, the pubic... Bone, how old was that? How, do you know how old that fetus was? In the book? Are you asking about the book? Old, that, yeah, no, well, that was an image of through the development of the fetus, right? So how old was the fetus uh, at that point? No, no, this is just like a, a modeling image. So he's just using this to show that um, these acupuncture meridians and these collagen um, fibrils are actually the primary determinants of shape control. And that when they get um, 
bent out of shape or they get um, noxious stimuli to any area, they'll elicit very reliable um, reflexes. And what he ends up getting to is that uh, the acupuncture meridians are actually extensions of these, which I'll touch on in a minute, but um, the, the next part of the, the model, so the first one is this um, sort of flexing around and, and recoiling almost like a jellyfish. And the next one, the, the pin is moved down to around the pubic bone. And instead of flexing around it, he, there's like a, an extension um, of the hips. So you're almost going into like a deadlift position with a very straight back. And he's only moved the pin. Oh, like man. A, so <laughs> that's where I got hit, man. I got hit right on my hip. And that's where my posture was for years. It was just like I felt like I was walking like this. It was just, it was terrible. Stuck in extension <laughs> or hyperlordosis of the back, right? So, oh, um, man, yeah. So it's interesting when we treat osteopathically or when someone's stuck in either hyperextension or, or flexion of the lumbar spine, working on the, the front, like, so through the abdomen, through different parts of um, the rectus umbilicus or, uh, oh, sorry, abdominus or um, in the psoas muscles can really release something that's seemingly a back problem, right? So you have to treat fronts and backs because you're complete. You're a complete organism. So um, Yeah. Well, it, what comes to mind also is it's like, you know, I mean, I – um, through that period of going through that like healing crisis, definitely experienced digestive changes and it always would coincide with changes in posture and releases of some of this old material. And sometimes it would just be like really overwhelming. Um, but yeah, it definitely seems like there was the fascia tissue around the digestive system is intimately connected to your, um, just it, your fascia sh to your I, I kind of lost my my space there. I saw a message come up. <laughs> I started double thinking. Um, but yeah, it, it yeah, seems like so that can affect organ function as well. Yeah. All right. So and, if, you, um, if you're like limping around on one leg for a while, you could be affecting your heart and your liver and your digestion. Well, indeed, and 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 what tends to happen is um, if there's been an injury that you have to walk around uh, with a limp or with the posture sort of uh, listed to one side for long enough, if that, um, if that injury prevails for so long that the brain has to reorganize your posture, that posture can get locked in that position, meaning if I have to be over here in order to avoid a, a right foot that's sore, and that goes on for long enough without the foot resolving, this will become my new normal. And so that's then dude, locking the Dude, I know down. exactly what you're talking about. I've lived it, man. Because it's like you have it's like you have two different neurological pathways for two body configurations going on at once. You have what you know you should be doing and what your body's really doing. And trying to reconcile that, I mean, it can take years, right? Like it's doesn't it's not a quick thing for me at least. Maybe I need your help. Well, the way <laughs> in which we, New Zealand. The, the way in which we would uh, sort of rectify that thing now and we discussed this briefly through through chat a few days ago tristan is is using the the dns methodology of um of using the developmental postures that are very very pure that exist in the central nervous system um in an immature brain so the, the baby's born the brain's immature it's at the mercy of where the parents put it but in the different positions that it's in on the floor stimulate the development which is essentially like the installation software for movement as an adult which is um essentially very pure when it, once it's finished installing. So in order to re-educate at the brain level where the posture is, you need to give the body better information. And so when we put uh, an adult, for example, who's uh, extremely out of plumb on the floor in developmental positions with good feedback, which might mean you know more contact with the floor through the forearm, the knees and the shins, or even just the back or the front actually touching the floor and some good spotting to, to put them where they belong, and then re-educate the breathing and the deep system activation of the diaphragm, you can actually retrain the brain to no center again. So the more pure the information about where you are in space, the more the brain can map the body and, and know its place um, against gravity. So um, it's not just a case of sort of stretching one side and trying to strengthen another or anything like that. It's actually a case of giving the right, brain... Yeah, get the strength in the posterior body. chain, right? If you strengthen your posterior chain, everything will be better. Well, hey, I did that, and then I strengthened it around certain imbalances, and then that made it harder for me to actually fix it later on. Yeah, it might have felt good at the time. It might have been a temporary – it created like a temporary rigidity, but then eventually it would always come back to bite me because it's like, oh, shoot, I'm still like – I can't connect my left heel to the ground and my hip at the same time. What the yeah, heck am I even deadlifting for? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if we can't even stand and have good sagittal stability, what business do we have lifting load? <laughs> you know? Right? On your back, on your spine, with your hands all goofy back here. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, crazy. what creature does that? <laughs> what, what creature would choose to carry these loads in such a, a ridiculous way? You try and make it the easier. Same creatures that would, the same creatures that would erect a microwave around them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we've done so. I mean, look what we've done, man. Look what have we done? Now there's hope, people. I'm hopeful. <laughs> we. I did an interview yesterday, man. I talked to Naudi Aguilar. Have you seen his functional patterns stuff? He's got some good Don't stuff me, on YouTube. Don't get me started. Okay. Uh, he, <laughs> <laughs> he was, man. I had a fun conversation with him. It was funny. He was going all over the place. Um, but yeah, he, I think he's got some interesting ways of looking at movement and stuff, and some of the exercises that he's got there. I really like, I like like some of the walking kettlebell stuff. I don't haven't really dove that deeply into his stuff, but what I've looked at so far, I like, what do you, do you have any like critiques on, on the methods that, uh, that he's using? Well, I know now he's a big fan of anatomy trains and he's, he's a big fan of performance oriented movement, i.e. any which way that the movement can be performed as long as it brings a result. Okay, so this comes from somebody who I believe has been involved in mixed martial arts or something of that nature, where, you know, win at all costs. Now, our camp come from a purity of movement um, framework, which is based on what's reliable, meaning, you know, if this is the way the human body develops without being taught, i.e. this DNS model of um, the human embryological and... Um, and developmental patterning. If that happens in every child worldwide without being taught by somebody, it's not subject to opinion. So if it's not subject to opinion, it must be the only um, program for pure human movement, right? So the problems that I see that come from all these sort of functional movement so-called specialists are, they're all someone's idea on what's right. Now, with the developmental model, what we see is as the child develops, it develops every, um, every part of every movement that it does involves a very, very pure uh, movement with full joint centration throughout the whole movement. Now, if the joint is centrated throughout its entire movement, it can't possibly be injured because it's controlled, it's got full congruency throughout the entire movement. Now, when you bring in some um, opinion-based training like, you know, I know now he's a big fan of anatomy trains because he spouts off about it all the time on his on his um, Instagram and Facebook. But when you're talking about something like a, uh, let's say it's a side to side shift movement, um, essentially you're talking about uh, an ipsilateral movement, and and yet now he would want to add in a rotational component. Now, if you add layers and layers of complexity for a movement that doesn't require. So you're talking about a side to side movement plus a rotational component, right? Like what would what would that be? That's like, I'm just lun like you lunge to the side and then you throw something or? What is well, let's say I'm facing you and I'm standing with my left mm -hmm. foot on, um, on a rock, right? And I want to jump, I want to keep yeah. facing you, but I want to jump onto a rock on the other side of the creek over here. So yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm leaving my left leg, I'm jumping off my left leg and I'm going to land on my right leg and decelerate the force here. So I don't actually need to add any kind of rotation into that movement, whether it's this way or this way, in order to get that done. I can do that, but the purest Yeah, you can do that from the sagittal plane. You can, you can jump back and forth like that. You don't need to rotate. Is that what no. you're talking about? He would add the rotate? Yeah, so we're actually moving in the frontal plane like this. There's, there's no need yeah. to further complexify that movement. It might look more flashy, but is, is it required? So mm. I, don't, I don't really want to kind of go on and on on camera and, and say one person's right. wrong and another person's right. But I think if you want to talk right. about... Right, I mean, it's a it seems movement. like it's a different way of implementing. Like you're working with people who are coming to you probably because health issues a lot of the times, right? Like you're, you work on a lot more than just movement. I mean, you're not... I know that you're comprehensive. Like you're very well-versed in nutrition and, you know, helping people fix their environments as well. And you do low-level uh, low light therapy or uh, was it laser therapy and other things. But um, it seems like like he's trying to train these athletes to go knock people out and you're trying to train people to uh, be healthy and, you know, 
recover there. Uh, yeah, look, there I just quicker. think what happens in, in the whole movement circles, and it's just really a product of, of being online and people having products and things like that that they're trying to sell, is that um, if, if somebody was to rubbish somebody else or, or call them out on, on one way in which they're teaching a methodology, it, it would be... It would, it would be the mark of an educated mind to me for that person to sort of say, okay, what, what are we talking about here? Maybe have a nice discussion on the principles. And if one person gets trumped, then we both move to the higher level with a better knowledge. But what I continually see in these circles is somebody calls them out on something and it's not necessarily saying, hey, this is wrong or this is right, but it's like, hey, let's discuss. And it's met with aggression and it's met with shutting the other person down and trying to maintain um, maintain the, their kind of image on the internet. Now, it's silly, and then you lose the content, right? And, it's like then you exactly. everyone's focused on this personality and this stupid battle, and there's no focus on the content. Everyone's like, <laughs> you know, worried about who looks cooler, and it's just like, well, ha how about we just discuss what freaking works, and we work yeah. on that. And and I mean that's that's what these community that's the beauty of the internet and these communities is we can shoot the shit like we are right now and we can talk about principles and when we come to the understanding together we've all moved to a higher level, but what happens uh, continually is somebody uh, brings up something that's incongruent with that other person's model, that other person shuts them down and then tries to bring in all their friends to kind of bully them out of the out of the discussion in a way and I, I just prefer if everyone could sort of talk about principles and sort of come to these the same kinds of conclusions with a better understanding it would be better for the evolution of um, knowledge so absolutely so th I think the DNS thing is fascinating man I've actually been employing lately um, on top of using a few of these exercises which I know now did recommend and uh, there's a few exercises that I have found from him so shout out like I appreciate the work um, I've been using those along with some DNS, and it's it's been really cool. So the um, the DNS, what does that stand for? It's dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, and yeah. this was sort of coined by the Prague School of Rehabilitation. Um, you know, some of the founding fathers of movement science, um, Vladimir Yanda, um, were involved in the setting up of that school. Um, I've seen some amazing stuff happen with it. I mean, people who cannot walk post car accident can be placed in developmental positions with uh, reflex stimulation points being stimulated, which is essentially uh, different bony prominences being um, having pressure applied that will elicit a crawling re reflex that is already in a CNS, just waiting to be expressed oh. again. So this is someone who couldn't walk, couldn't move, was a complete vegetable. Put them in a developmental wow. position, stimulate the reflex um, points, and crawling begins to happen involuntarily. So it shows that these movement patterns are here. And it's actually not um, something that, you know, has to be taught. It's there, it's waiting to be expressed, and it's your birthright. So, I mean, the power of this sort of thing cannot be underestimated. The, I think where it gets lost or where it hasn't gained popularity is it's not flashy. You know, it's reliable. It's not flashy. It's not the next big thing. It doesn't involve, you know, tools and kettlebells oh, no. and this and that. It's, it's, just, it's, it's the, the opposite of it's the opposite of flashy. It's definitely the opposite. I mean, if you guys look up DNS chart or, uh, or DNS poster, on Google, um, you could see some of the developmental positions, and yeah, it might not look flashy, it might not look um, awesome or cool. You're not gonna like, you know, go put it on your Instagram in your hot pink yoga pants and your little Lululemon top. Um, <laughs> but yeah. it's pretty. I mean, it's really fun. It's really engaging. And if you get into some of these positions and you do some deep breathing, some relaxation and breathing, and Focus on like at least, well, at least what I like to do, and I don't even know if this is correct, but I like to get in some of these developmental positions, just like on the back, with the hands up and the feet up, um, stuff like that, um, and then deep breathe and feel how how mellowly I can hold my limbs up. Meaning, how how can I hold these positions with the least amount of tension and the exactly, least amount yes. of effort? And it's not, and it's the opposite of how can I do a bench press putting the most amount of force into my chest, which, yeah. which to me is completely counterproductive as somebody who's super high energy, who's super perceptive, very, 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 very sensitive to my environment. Um, to me, like locking up like that all the time and focusing on that and training that tension, it's just not good. It doesn't result in long term health. Unless, of course, maybe it was balanced out in a certain way, but I've really just moved over to this 
really different form of um, just mellowly using kettlebells, never over 20 kilos for um, some resistance training and doing some push-ups and stuff sometimes because I still like the push-ups. But um, well, this and is doing thing, these it, when when you can make exercise um, effortless, you know that you've improved. Whereas if things have to continually get harder to see any kind of improvement, all you're forcing is some sort of hypertrophy, which is a an evolutionary um, expenditure in, in growth to put up with a certain stress, right? So essentially hypertrophy of musculature happens when you've done something inefficiently. It's so inefficient that the body has to grow to adapt to that movement. Now, what you'll see with a very balanced body uh, through what you're discussing right now with, with these um, efficient movement patterns and feeling that you're connected and, and graceful and movement is, is joyous and easy, what you're seeing is, is the movement is so pure that it doesn't require growth. So it doesn't require any kind of expenditure, you know? If you have to expend energy to put up with the stress, you're by definition inefficient. <laughs> it should be as easy as possible with as least expenditure in adapting to that, um, that situation. And that means you're an efficient organism that can put up with all kinds of different stuff. So. All right. So if you're, if you're training inefficiency five days a week for an hour to two hours per session, training inefficiency tension, urgh, like gritting your teeth and stuff like that, I mean, these are these positions are getting ingrained neurologically. It's just it to me. It's uh, it seems so well, silly at this point. <laughs> it becomes your new holding pattern that you have to be on tension all the time just to maintain uprightness. So um, that's what Professor happens. Yander, it does happen. Yeah. Professor Yonder from the Prague School said, you know, any tightness, any groove you see in the body, i.e., six pack abs, you know, grooving of musculature, means that there is tension there or a tightness and any tightness is a symbol of an inefficiency of the whole organism moving as a, as a dynamic creature. So if any, if any groove is a tightness and any tightness is an insufficiency, if you're training to have six pack abs, you're by definition locking yourself down and destroying your freedom of movement. So, right. And, and how's that going to affect your digestion down the line? If you're training to have six pack abs, that means that you're walking around trying to create this holding pattern, which is probably neurologically associated with an insecurity or with some sort of uh, image, like a self image that is askew. You're walking around. If you're like the abdominal wall, you're not, if I'm standing here, I could be so, so lean. But if I'm standing here with good posture and breathing deeply, and like healthily breathing and feeling the sensations as like the energy flows all the way to the fingertips and all through the fascia network out to the skin. If I'm doing that, mm -hmm. there's no way I'm going to be having a six pack. The way that I can have a six pack, like I'm very lean right now. The only way I got a six pack mm -hmm. is if I tense it up in a certain way and stand in a certain way, which is not a natural way to stand or tense the body. So what yeah. the hell are these people doing training for six pack abs? Every time they take their shirt off, they're feeling that, oh, I got to have my six pack, got to have my six pack. And it's, man, I mean, what kind of health consequences is this going to have if you're consistently training those holding patterns with the stress of the insecurity? It's just, it's absolutely crazy. Well, one of the, one of the worst things that happened to training circles was the, um, the image basis of, of fitness, right? So people walk into a gym and the posters that are all around show these sorts of phenotypes on the wall as if there's something to be, um, you know, uh, desired. And the minute this image basis comes into it, we've destroyed everything that nature has provided in terms of, of this body that is a bit of a, a, a do-it-all sort of a creature. Like, we're, we're not the fastest creature on the planet. We're not the strongest, but we're, we've got a damn good repertoire of things that we actually can accomplish through our physical um, nature. And We can kill the fastest creatures, though. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, this is the thing, is the trade-off for a human being is the big brain. So we've sacrificed all this yeah. physical prowess to become a, a bit of a jack of all trades with a massive brain that can innovate solutions to things. So mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's almost our downfall as well because it's the neocortex and this sort of um, frontal lobe that's created the idea that there's an image base of fitness that's then destroyed our physical even more. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, crazy, uh, it's kind of ironic. It's really. crazy, man. Well, and and the, the madness of this pervades the fitness industry too. Like I actually had an example of it today um you know my my body has not changed much in the last year and a half what has changed is the way that i treat it the way that the collagen network and the energy flows through it and the training that i do now even though i've stopped doing heavy movements and barbell stuff i haven't lost muscle i've actually just integrated that muscle that was already there within the structure so i'm the same weight 
but it feels different. It feels better. And my posture is different. And it was funny though, because I uh, there's somebody just commented on a video like, Tristan, you look so, and a lot of it's angles and shit too, man. Like people got to realize, look, the fitness industry, if I take a freaking camera, like most of the videos that I make, I'm just walking around with my iPhone. When I hold my iPhone in front of me, it's really close to my body. My shoulders, I got broad shoulders. I'm pretty lean and it's like angles can do a lot, right? Like if you stand like this, I look much bigger than if I stand like this. I look like a little guy. So there's angles involved too. So like this dude comments like, Tristan, you look so you look so uh, malnourished. You look so malnourished. Like you lost so much muscle mass. What happened? And I'm like, dude, I'm just not holding the iPhone chest level staring straight up at me. It's like, and the, the madness is crazy. I mean, these, this is what people think. The first thing they see. And the video had nothing to do with like body and nothing to do with like body composition. It was just like, what the f- Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you know, so I guess this is a limitation of using the internet for communication is, is it is, it's either visual or it's, uh, it, it's auditory. So um, between the yeah. two, we're sort of limiting what we can see. And, and this is why I think, you know, live events and, and seminars and things where you can get to, have your hands on people and, and feel and sort of see from all angles are really important for truly talking about this sort of stuff. I mean, I get asked a lot of times on Facebook, you know, how do I do the movement that you're suggesting for X condition? And it's like, I can't tell you this sort of stuff over the internet. This is not something that I can just sort of describe in words. I have to have my hands on you. I have to position you in the right spot. I have to be able to coach you and cue you and feel the tension in your different tissues. It's not, I guess this is a, a, the beauty of what I do, I guess, on this, um, from this perspective, is I can't be replaced by a fucking machine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're the only job in medicine that will not be yeah. replaced by robots. Yeah, you know, we're gonna be going into the the hospital is just gonna be like full of vending machines in the future. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, will, yeah. Well, there's there's the difference between you and Naudi. Naudi yesterday somehow got on a tangent about the robots, and he's he's down for the robot revolution, and he'll take the microchip too. After yeah. knowing. After knowing that the people won't, uh, that it's not dangerous. That was, that was his position. So you guys, you got a different position on training and the micro trip in the robots. So I'm glad well, we hit on that. It takes all types of people to be on the planet for the world to go around, mate. <laughs> That's it all takes, It does. And this is what's so cool. And, and to have an intelligent conversation and uh, be able to um, accept other ideas and look at them for what they are and not be, um, you know, defensive about, about what we're talking about is great. So I, I always enjoy the guests that I have on. It's a lot of fun. Like I had a lot of fun talking to Natty yesterday too. But anyways, let's, um, what else? I mean, this is, we were talking about holding patterns and stuff like that. We talked about DNS, the child development. Um, um, how, what about breathing? I mean, how does breathing work into this? Because it is, a, it's like you're moving, expanding and contracting a little bit. You're moving in a, how, how does the breath affect the fascia and the, the movement of water through the fascia tissue um, and the movement of electricity? Well, the breath's a really important thing, and, and particularly, I'll, I guess I'll touch on the diaphragm as a central, um, well, first of all, the central stabilizing muscle of the entire body. So the true core, if you want to use that horrible word that makes everyone twitch and makes their eyes roll, is um, <laughs> essentially... Uh, deep system stability or true core is really from intra-abdominal pressure. So um, if you imagine like a, a, a coffee plunger, you know, with the, you put the coffee beans in the bottom and pour the water and you've got the thing that plunges down, the, the bit that's plunging down is analogous to the way the diaphragm sits in the chest cavity here. And it, it's undergoing this sort of um, jellyfish movement in breathing something like 30,000 times a day. Um, now, 30,000 times a day and then doing it overnight as well while you're asleep, albeit at a lesser rate, and then doing it 33,000 times the following day and the following day and the following day and never getting tired, I think that's some kind of muscle that is special because I can't imagine anyone doing 33,000 bicep curls and even considering doing it the next day. So um, the diaphragm's doing this at all times. It's bringing oxygen in and sending carbon dioxide out. And at the same time, it's creating intra-abdominal pressure that stabilizes the spine and pelvis. And at the same time, it's creating pressure gradients inside the lymphatic system that help push uh, blood, venous return, and, and lymphatic fluid around the body. 
because remember that we're talking about um, a pressure regulator inside a trunk which is actually airtight apart from these valves that we call nostrils a mouth if it's open and of course we've got the sphincters at the bottom that hold everything in so the more um the more powerfully this diaphragm is sort of undergoing excursion the more powerful lymphatic drainage we have the more stable the spine will be and the better our oxygenation of tissues will be um, provided we're not hyperventilating and blowing off all the co2 um, because we need CO2 retention um, to vasodilate and also to potentiate the pore effect where we drop oxygen off to tissues. So um, it's an extremely important organ and um, the, the, breath, the breath and the, the uh, autonomic nervous system are, all, are so intertwined that, for example, you see somebody who gets a large stress in their life and the breathing directly goes up in here into accessory motion of respiration. <gasps> so we're gasping, you know, using the upper chest to drive the breath. And that's directly correlated with sympathetic tone, meaning the flight and fright system. So if breathing gets stuck like that, you can potentiate the, um, the activity of the sympathetic nervous system such that it's always on. And you can never reach healing if you're always stuck in sympathetic drive. Uh, it's a parasympathetic mediated activity healing. So bringing the breath back down to the uh, abdomen, so basically the lower ribs expanding and the abdomen um, uh, pushing out as the diaphragm undergoes its descent, um, is gonna bring us back to parasympathetic mode, a restful state for the body and healing can occur. So again, um, we talked about overtraining a couple of weeks ago. If we're always overdoing it and we're always stuck in sympathetic drive, how the hell are we gonna improve? If we can't bring the body back down to let these uh, you know, these hormetic um, exercise induced stresses actually um, create some change in the body. We need that to happen when we're at rest. If we can't be at rest, we can't do anything. So this is what we often see. Someone is exhausted, stressed, they complain of low back pain because they've destabilized the back because the breath's up here. <laughs> uh, they have poor oxygenation of tissues because they're hyperventilating. They're blowing off all the CO2. Blood pressure as a result's going up because they can't vasodilate because they're blowing off all the CO2. And the entire pattern is just um, one of the illness, essentially. So now, here's, here's a question. So, 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 okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Keep going. I was just going to say, breath <laughs> in itself can actually modulate all these other processes, just as breath is a result of these other processes as well. So, as the stress goes up, the uh, sympathetic drive comes up, and, and the breathing becomes more accessory, neck and chest dominated. But we can also yeah. use breathing techniques. It's like two knobs. So the stress goes up, the breathing goes up, um, but we can also turn the breathing back down, which will modulate the, the stress knob as well. So the kind of uh, yeah. the part of the hip well, there's something the raw to, to change the other one. So. Yeah. Well, all right. So you're talking about the stress in the breathing into the upper chest. So I know like if I'm standing around now, I've of course, I've got some postural you know, things that I'm working on, you know, attaching my glutes to my heels and working on some of the stabilization. Um, so I know my, my diaphragm is not working optimally, but if I do get in the right position and I focus and just take focus and intent. And that's, that's what's so, um, interesting to me about this whole process is how much intent and focus it really takes for me not for everybody. For some people, it can be easy. For some people, they never even need to focus on it at all. They're just healthy breathers, healthy movers their entire life. They never make mistakes that I made. Um, I don't know. I haven't met that many of those, though. <laughs> but um, I, I know that sometimes, like even if I'm breathing right now, like just, you know, into the diaphragm, kind of nice breath. Sometimes, though, I really like to go up all the way, just... And then release it, and it seems to reduce the like stress in the body. Um, and I'm doing the opposite; like I'm breathing into that stressful mode, but I'm kind of doing it consciously. Is is there something that is different there? Um, does my well, question make sense? Do I sound no, like I a blithering idiot? I, well, I think this tends to happen when people are stressed: is they they do that huge breath in and that expulsion. Um, you know, it's like a, a filling all the way, filling the balloon up and then letting go of the valve so that the balloon sort of <laughs> all the way around the room sort of thing. And it, it does seem relaxing and it seems to happen in those who are very, very anxious. Um, but what I see is chronically people can get stuck in that. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure what the actual yeah. effect of that is, whether it's just sort of like a release or, or something of that nature of, you know, pent up energy or something. But I was working with um, someone a few weeks ago who was perpetually stuck in that and I could not get her to bring 
the breath and the deep system on by, by bringing the diaphragm down and pushing toward pelvic floor, you know, creating that coffee plunger, deep system stability effect. And she always complains of low back pain. And I, I wasn't able to get her to relax and do that until I got her to breathe into a bag to retain some carbon dioxide. So what I figure might be happening is um, she's poorly oxygenated because she has no CO2 retention. So her brain gives her the perception that she needs to breathe more. And yet the more air she gets in, the less she can retain oxygen for the tissue. So she's blowing it all off again. And it's stuck in this perpetual life. I need more oxygen, but I can't because I've got no CO2. You know, metabolism's failing, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm not really sure how to answer that in terms of like what's happening with that relaxation effect. Yeah. But I know that if it gets stuck like that chronically is bad news. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If you do that, like, all right, so if I were to do some breathing exercises and I, I don't know, I, I kind of like the way that Wim Hof um, teaches it. I don't, I'd like to hear your opinions on it. He doesn't go too yeah. deep into it. He lets, kind of pe he lets people kind of figure it out themselves. But the way that he cued it, he said, just figure it out. I was able to find a nice, relaxed way to do it, and it worked incredibly well. And I know if I, if I really go, like I can really boost that stress hormone. And if I can control it, it's not like it doesn't feel like a negative thing. But I definitely like I don't feel a need or a desire to go those deep breaths. I kind of I just kind of do a nice. Um, yeah. Well, I, I have just a feel that relaxation. Yeah, I have a mm -hmm. colleague who's a, a breathing specialist and he went and saw Wim Hof's thing when he came out to Australia and uh, I said, what did you think? And he actually said, if this guy wasn't so capable at doing the things that he does, if he wasn't such a freak, he would have walked out in five minutes because mm -hmm. the breathing is completely dysfunctional and actually relies on raising these stress hormones. Now, whether he's the kind of freak who can actually control that stress response and keep it under wraps, um, remains to be seen. I actually think some people have a, a better stress capacity and they can deal with higher levels of catecholamines and cortisol, etc., cetera, um, than others who are more susceptible. And that might come down to his hormone profile. You know, he might have very low estrogen and quite high testosterone. I think that's probably quite obvious looking at his physique well, and whatnot. All right, so, so just to, to throw a little wrench in there, didn't he train people to do this and then they did clinical studies where the endotoxin study that he, that he references all the time? Yeah, like he I've trained read 12 individuals. But in terms of, um, of breathing, he's hyperventilating. So he's blowing off all the CO2. Now, what he claims in a lot of these videos and indeed in the live event that my colleague Tim went to was that no matter um, what's happening, the more you're breathing, the more you're oxygenating. But that's not true because we know the Bohr effect relies on retention of CO2. So when you would consult with someone like Tim, my colleague, the breathing specialist, you, you would be um, plugged into a capnograph, which shows a graph on the computer screen, and it, it's, it's actually taking information about your O2 and CO2 levels. And it's very, very hard. There's an exercise um, for breathing correctly in which you have to retain uh, expired CO2 above a certain threshold, above a certain line, which means that you're functionally using, um, the, making the most of the oxygen that you're actually inspiring and putting it towards metabolic work. Now, if it's dropping below that, um, you're by definition not using it to your potential and you're blowing off too much. So um, if you're hyperventilating in the way Hoff is teaching, you're actually not oxygenating tissues. So I posit that what's happening is you're actually stimulating nitrous oxi uh, nitric oxide um, release, which, is, which can eventually block your mitochondria. You remember talking to Ruben, the effect of red light is actually disassociating nitric oxide from cytochrome C oxidase in mitochondria. So if you have too much nitric oxide, whilst it's vasodilating, it's an emergency vasodilator. So I posit that he's actually vasodilating using nitric oxide and getting um, uh, you know, an acute effect um, of, of blood flow increase through that mechanism. But he may be well better off actually retaining more CO2, which is inherently vasodilating. So um, rather than using your emergency systems, I mean, they do allow you to do great things, but do you want them doing those great things chronically? Uh, I would say no. I would say that the uh, the more relaxed state you can be in, the better your adaptation will be. I guess. Well, just if I'm going to be a, a Wim Hof apologist, the uh, the uh, the other side of that would be like they would say that what you're doing is you're learning to control the stress response. You're bringing the stress response up in a controlled manner, controlling it consciously, and then 
for the rest of the day, you're able to better deal with the stress response. I mean, it, it's, I don't know. It is something yeah, that I, really helped me. Like I, I really enjoyed it. Maybe I was just so high from hyperventilating, but it's something well, that, that it seemed to benefit me a lot. Well, I think, you know, this is, this is essentially one of the hallmarks of evolutionary stress though, isn't it? I mean, the more an organism comes into contact with the stressor, the better it gets at adapting to it. And those who are the best at adapting to it are the ones who tend to survive. So, um, I mean, it's evolution 101, but I think that sort of thing, it, I mean, you shouldn't take these sorts of shows on the road to billions and billions of people who are who don't know better and probably have less of a capacity to deal with those sorts of stresses than say you and Wim Hof because you end up hurting a lot of people. So, um, you know, it, it, there's no secret, Tristan, that you're a pretty fit guy and, and you probably get away with being pretty fit without doing much as well. And I think he's probably of a similar ilk. And I think the people who get good results with that kind of method probably have that genotype that, you know, allows them to be quite resilient to multitude of stresses without succumbing. But, um, as you said before, I'm you know, I, I don't know. I, mean, I, grew, I grew up with asthma, grew up with asthma and allergies and, uh, you know, just chronic inflammation. I was pretty, I got pretty chubby from the age of like 14 to 22. I haven't always yeah. been fit. <laughs> okay. But yeah, now it probably looks like it's easy for me to stay fit. And now it is just because I've built a lifestyle and habits that kind of keep me there and it feels good. So I, I maintain it. But before it yeah. felt good for me to eat, um, you know, Costco danishes all day and barely move my body um, all throughout high school and just wait for the weekends when you go out and drink alcohol and destroy your liver and, you know, just very, very clever behavior. Well, that's a good point as well because, I mean, the, the types of people who forge these lifestyles for themselves and are a little bit interested in health have done the homework in order to kind of understand a lot of the background physiology and, and the background stuff to what is creating a healthy environment and a healthy body. And these people can probably ad adapt better than, say, someone who sees Wim Hof on 60 Minutes, sees the show come along, um, oh, I'll go and see that, I'll buy my ticket for 200 bucks. I'll do this breathing and then I'm fucking wiped out for a week. I mean, well, I guess what I'm trying to do is not rubbish Wim Hof, but I'm contextualizing yeah. the method in, in the context of um, people's general health. And, and as I was about to say, I, like I, I, I work clinically, so um, I deal with people who are fucked up basically. And they're always looking for what's the next thing I can do that will make me well. But I'm often saying stop looking for the next thing and look for what's foundationally reliable all the time. You know, the next big thing is just another party trick online, you know. Um, what about the reliability? And the same now, sort what of about, thing. I mean, yoga, yogic breathing. Yogic breathing has been around for a long time. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to get a good idea. I mean, it's something that fascinates me, right? There's so many different methods of like pranayama and different types of yogic breathing, uh, square breathing, circular breathing. There's so many different methods. And um, a lot of people swear by all of them, right? Just like Wim Hof's method, loads of people swear by all these different methods. Um, let's. Um, I think. Look, I, I think was the ask. in yoga and all these experiments is the, the the nice thing about them is they're not sort of trying to come from an authoritarian perspective and saying this is right, that's wrong. They're saying let's do the experiment and listen. So let's see what's possible. Mm -hmm. And they're playing with what's actually inherently possible in the body, which I think is fantastic. I'm not the kind of person who thinks, you know, this is right, this is wrong. But what I am very good at is, is looking at the totality of what's out there and doing experiments based on, um, first of all, intuition, and second of all, scientific um, regimes that fit what I see intuitively or in direct experience and coming up and sort of coming up with what I think is reliable and continues to show up as being something that's helpful um, in the face of everything else coming and going. And so when, when you um, sit with what's possible in the body and do the experiments, I think you figure it out eventually. And that's, I guess, what yoga has always done is it's like, oh, what if I can get in this position? What happens then? What happens? How do I feel after I do this? How do I feel after I do that? And it's, it's the great experiment. Um, of course, there's so many iterations of yoga, but what they're actually playing with is how can I modulate this diaphragm to breathe in different ways? And that's fantastic because what it does is it brings an awareness of the human body back, you know? People have lost so much awareness of, of their body in general. Um, we, we get people on the bench and try and get them to experiment with this sort of breathing and say things like, now, what do you notice? And they just say, I don't know. It's like, if you can't even notice your own body, 
what the hell, what business do you have taking it out and about? You know, it's sort of like, <laughs> it's, it's amazing, man. And look, me, I, like I look really fit or whatever, uh, but there's parts of my body that I have, like I just, I, I can't move them that well. I'm not that well connected with them. And there's parts of my body that I'm reclaiming constantly. I mean, it's just like the mind. It is the yeah. mind, right? I mean, it's, it's, it is, it is you and you're not in control of everything you do. If you pretend you're in total control, you're a liar. You have no control. Look at all the automatic movements, the little nervous movements. Almost everybody is constantly making. We are not always in control. And I think, um, I think the, the way that the fascia system relates to emotional, mental, psychological states is just, it's so fascinating. Everything about it to me, just, um, I, I'm, I'm always amazed with um, how much I don't know. And your, you, the way that you describe what you think is going on physiologically when Wim Hof teaches people this breathing method and how it's different from what he says, um, what he says it is and what he, and I, don't, I haven't read the studies, but he said and in the study where they were uh, where they did the endotoxin thing, they took blood um, and the blood oxygen levels and pH levels were shooting up and they lasted for an extended period of time. And he says he's going to do stuff with Stanford. He's going to do some research and some studies with Stanford. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but I think I think it's really interesting. It's something that should be studied, right? I mean, there's these two completely different um models right here for what's actually going on they're totally different and they both kind of make sense if you're looking at it in the right at the right angle in the right light so um yeah, yeah this and, is it's going to be cool to see what happens moving forward all the cortical hormones increase in acute stress i mean it's no secret that um when cortisol spikes acutely so too does dhea to control the mechanism of stress so these things need to be looked at on a chronic basis so what happens if you breathe like that all day for 10 days probably what happens is on the 10th day you're extremely ill so i mean what i what i would like to see happen is these things get contextualized again and not thrown out there josh will be back guys don't worry <laughs> what a podcast right i like doing these live Supernova1976 says, different horses for different courses. Yeah, absolutely agree, man. It's not one size fits all. Josh is a very, very intelligent guy. If, if any of you haven't noticed, Josh knows his stuff. If any of you haven't noticed, he's well-versed in a very, very wide array of, um, of aspects of health. And this guy has done his research. He knows. So um, oh, I guess I say, I'm not saying he knows because nobody knows everything. But I highly value his opinion, and it definitely makes me think twice, although I have been really enjoying that breathing. And I probably don't do it the same as a lot of people do. Um, I just took his cues, breathe deep for three minutes, then hold your breath. That's what I do. I breathe deep and relax and just hold my breath at the end. I liked it, but um, I might have to change my opinion on it according to new information. Oh, no. Is that allowed on the Internet? All right. Josh is back. What's up? You back? You hear me? Are you muted? Just make sure you're not muted. Is that better? Yep. Now you're here. Yeah. I like what there you were you saying are. because um, this is this is the um, foundational problem with with what science is doing now and it's a foundational problem of this internet based uh, information in a way is that everyone appears as an authority but there are no authorities all we can do is point towards what we currently understand discuss it unpack it and then hopefully our understanding uh, improves so what i like to do is take as many sources as possible put them all up against each other and again i'll use the same wording as before see what's reliable see what consistently shows up rather than um Now's the new fad thing, here's another fad thing, etc. And part of the issue with appearing as an authority, um, and almost this goes back to as well, layering on top of the image basis of uh, um, fitness and things like this is, we take someone like Wim Hof who can do shit that no one else can do, so they, therefore we must associate the means by which he's doing it as the right way. Does that make right. sense? Like what, what, side, what side does he sleep on? 
you know? <laughs> well, all this sort of stuff. And it's the same thing with these fitness gurus. I mean, you don't become an ins- Uh oh. Josh is cut off again. All right. He'll be back. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, look, the, the uh, supposed authorities that you give your energy to, that you, that people worship in a lot of ways, are not really authorities. The emperor's got no clothes, his butt naked, was a baby once, just like us. So, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, about, it's about the truth. It's about what works. It's not about what somebody says. And just because Josh says something, even though I highly respect him and I know he's highly intelligent, he's done his research and he's applying this in his daily life. He's working in a clinical setting for years. Um, it doesn't mean that anything that Josh says is going to automatically be gospel. It doesn't mean that if Josh says, look, if you jump up and down with a can of Pepsi on your head 20 times, it's going to fix your hyperlordosis. It, it, just because somebody's highly intelligent, just because somebody's got a little, got three letters stamped next to their name, doesn't mean that everything they say is absolute gospel truth. So I think Josh is back. What's up, Josh? You back, man? Josh is trying to come back. We'll see when his audio comes. Um, where you at, man? Coming? Come back, Josh. Anyways, this has been fascinating so far, right, guys? <laughs> All right. When Josh gets back, we'll wrap this up. As you see, the sun is going down. The day is receding here in the Andes of Ecuador. Um, We've hit on all kinds of stuff. I really uh, would encourage everybody. Hmm. Let's see. Josh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, there you go. Go for hmm. it, man. What were you uh, saying? I can't remember where I was. I was I just going know. to say the, the confounding nature of, of what we're seeing, and I, I keep dragging everything back to this. It seems like a hatred of the internet, even though it's bringing us. You hate, what we're you hate progress. Oh. Listen, Why do you but, progress, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I was just saying you don't become the image basis that's attached to a lot of these things, like with Wim Hof, but also um, there's a I don't even know the woman's name, but she's like an Instagram sensation in Australia in in fitness. Now, when I watch the sort of shit she does, I fucking hate it. But she looks from the um, uh, conventional perspective, you know, quite I guess beautiful and you know quote unquote fit, and so she becomes extremely famous, and then everybody takes what she says is the right way because she fits a certain image with it. And I, I just hate that things can come. We're in this kind of world where things can come and go so quickly that everyone just grabs onto what seems to be the new way all the time without looking at what's consistently reliable. And that, that's probably the theme of everything I've been saying. Wow. Wow. All right. I hope that sinks in for you guys. Internet health community, fitness community, people well, you don't <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, Instagram sensation in the fitness or movement world if you look like you know probably me you know you, you have to be some <laughs> some woman who looks like a supermodel and this and that and then you become extremely famous I mean it's just the thing that people latch onto because we're so culturally ingrained to accept what is um, you know from the image basis said to be correct I suppose or something like that, that that's where yeah. my frustration well, was <laughs> Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, you're not going to – the Instagram world, the, this is this – is this, it might be a majority of people that get hypnotized into that image-based culture, that the falseness, the, the surface, the glitter, the glitz, the glam, the pop music and all that. But at the same time, I mean, it's just like when you look at pop music. I mean, it's trash. It's garbage. It's the yeah. music of decline. It's the, it's the clatter of the music of the spheres. You listen to this crap, but it doesn't mean that all music sucks, right? It's like there's still – smaller groups of people who are absolutely um you know oh, there goes josh again there are still groups of people and communities that are very tuned in that are highly intelligent dynamic people and don't just want to look at the surfaces now um unfortunately the the unconscious or i say unconscious but that's kind of a loaded term the um this more like image based um vain vanity based bling bling that's not even the word anymore that was when i was a kiddo but um 
unfortunately, this stuff seems to be the loudest, but that doesn't mean that it's all that's going on. So, um, yeah, it, there's been so much that we talked about in the last hour and a half. Um, we talked about developmental, uh, the development of the fetus and how this relates to movement patterns. We talked about DNS, dynamic neuros, neuromuscular stabilization. We talked about breathing. We talked about what else did we talked about? <laughs> fascia. We talked about the amazing, miraculous fascia network, how the water and electricity and therefore magnetism of our body is intimately connected with this network, which is ubiquitous throughout the entire body, goes all the way through you, permeates through you, and um, is really at the core of your being. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, Josh got cut off there. I'm going to I'm going to bug Josh and make him come back on again someday. He <laughs> he's gone. So Josh is, Josh tells me through Skype. He says, "Look, my internet's gone. I'm sorry." <laughs> he says, "Sorry if I started getting on a hater tangent." Josh, I don't think that was a hater tangent at all. It was very cogent argument. The conversation that I had yesterday balances out with this very very well. So and for those of you who are listening to this at a later date, when I talk about the conversation that I had yesterday, I'm talking about the podcast I did with Mr. Naudi Aguilar from Functional Patterns, who I do still very much enjoy his YouTube videos and a lot of the work that he does. Um, so, yeah, look at that. Me sitting right in between two different opinions and saying that I think they both have validity. Wow. On the internet... All right, so there you go, guys. I don't know everything. Josh doesn't know everything. Nobody knows everything. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna leave it at that. Do some more research. If you guys want to look into um, look into the videos that Josh mentioned, he mentioned a book called Muscles and Meridians. I talked about anatomy trains. I didn't really get deep into what Josh thinks about anatomy trains and Thomas Meyer's system. Um, it seemed like he might have disagreed with some of the fundamental principles of it. But um, yeah, what else we talk about? We talked about that uh, that video of the collagen network underneath the skin. Um, I'll put links to these things down below on the YouTube video and in the description on the website for the podcast if we put this up as an audio. When I put this up as an audio. So anyways, thank you so much for joining us guys. I'm glad you guys enjoyed this. This was a fascinating conversation. One of the best podcasts I've done in a long, long time. So um, it's about healthy movement. Healthy movement is not clenching yourself into a bench press and deadlift constantly, creating rigid movement patterns in the superficial muscles of the body. It's about healthy movement. It's about fluidity. It's about being able to dynamically react to environmental changes and difficulties in the environment and enjoy it and recover from it. So Josh Lamaro, you can find him on Facebook as Paleo Osteo. If you look up Paleo Osteo, you can find his stuff. Josh Lamaro, thanks for coming on, dude. You're coming on again. Um, I'm going to lie and tell the audience that you already agreed to come on again and talk more about some of this stuff because uh, that was fun. All right, everybody, have a good night. It's Friday night here. Um, have an awesome night for those watching live. And there's been so many awesome take-home messages <laughs> from this podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed. You can find more stuff at primaledgehealth.com. Um, let me throw a little plug in there for the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook. I know we've talked about diet a lot on this channel. But we don't always talk about diet. And somebody was asking, how does the fascia relate to keto earlier? Um, <laughs> we're not just a keto channel, folks. But for those of you wanting some keto stuff, go check out the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook. My wife worked her butt off on it. It was a labor of love. And the reviews are awesome. So thanks for all the positive reviews to everybody. I'll see you all next time. PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Peace.